Tom Pelissero joins us right now. Tom, uh, good to see you. Are you uh, relaxed and are you refreshed from your three-day travel across the country? You know, we got, TJ and I got a lot of mileage because, uh, you know, Del Tufo and Brockman didn't bother showing up for the Friday show. And what's up to uh, <laughs> my boys in the studio hey, there? Hey, hey, TJ hey, and I got hey, a lot of mileage hey, out hey. of, you know, like, what's the worst thing that can happen if we screw up in our jobs mm -hmm. versus the guy who messes up one line of code and crashes the entire global economy? <laughs> Little did I know that my flight from LAX to Minneapolis would be canceled Friday night, canceled again Saturday night. I'd be rerouted to Salt Lake City where my connection was delayed 14 hours before that too was canceled. Rebooked through San Francisco, knocked to standby while I was asleep oh in the lobby at the airport God. on a bench, rebooked through Portland. Thankfully, that flight was delayed, and I happened to look at the app and see that my bag was not on the plane. It was out in the lobby, outside security at the baggage desk. I found the suitcase. People in line were cheering for me, like, hey, <laughs> somebody got one. And I'm like, I don't have a flight, but I got the bag. I went to the Hertz counter, and uh, about 26 hours later and 1,200 miles, I was home. This wow. is a total, total nightmare. I mean, that is, a, that is a debacle of mythic proportions. So my follow-up question has to be, who was angrier, you or C.D. Lamb right now? <laughs> <laughs> I think I went through uh, different periods, you know, all the, the stages of grief there. And listen, there's other people who had it way worse than me, looking at the thousand people who were in line, you know, trying to get vouchers and figure out where they were going. At least I was able to go, hey, I got my bag back. I'm going to drive. I don't think that C.D. Lamb is angry i haven't sensed that this is really contentious i know that he was around the dallas area this summer um people from the cowboys saw him at various events like this is this is business right now and business is good if you're a top wide receiver in the nfl cd lamb picked a good time to have an absolute monster season he's now sitting there on the fifth year option on his contract taking up a good chunk of cap space right now for the Cowboys and Justin Jefferson just topped all the other receiver deals that got done and got four years, 140 million. That's 35 a year. That is so far beyond where the wide receiver market was just a couple of years ago. I mean, think about this, Susie. You go back just two off seasons when Tyreek got traded to Miami and Devontae Adams uh, went to the Raiders. You know, Tyreek Hill, really, it's a $25 million a year deal. It's 30 on paper, but that includes a $45 million number in the last year. 25 is really the paper number. Devontae Adams, same thing. It's 28 on paper. It's really more like 22 and change. Justin Jefferson's got a legit 35. So you're talking about a two-year span, a more than 50% increase, or roughly 50% increase in the top of the wide receiver market. CeeDee Lamb's got the leverage here. You know, his worst case scenario is, okay, he comes back, he plays out this season, they tag him next year, he's got to play on the tag, and then the second year tag number would be borderline cost prohibitive. The, the Cowboys need to find a way to get something done, their full intention is to get something done, but it's not surely about, you know, solely about the dollars here. You got to remember, you know, there's also the dynamics of what agents are involved, what teams are involved. Every team has different contract structures. Well, the Cowboys historically have done really long contract extensions. They've done five, in some case, six-year extensions. Dak had all the leverage a few years back. He got a shorter deal, but most of their extensions are really long. Well, CD's agent, Tory Dandy kind of invented the three-year wide receiver contract extension when he did Sammy Watkins years ago. And that's why, you know, DK got a three-year extension. Debo, I believe, was a three-year extension. So you're going to have to to close the gap here, not just in terms of the money, but also the length, the structure of this contract. Those are all things that they're working through at a time that the Cowboys also are trying to figure out what to, how they're going to get something done with Dak Prescott. And they've got Micah Parsons waiting in line, though that's probably a, a 2025 problem to solve. I just don't understand, Tom Pelissero, why they wouldn't have wanted to get this sewn up so that he could get on the plane to Oxnard, which, of course, they don't have to. They can get there however they want to. But why wouldn't they, if it's an inevitability, why wouldn't they just want to get it sewn up ahead of time? Dak also was not on the plane, by the way, but that's because he's been in California. He's meeting them out there in Oxnard. So not concerned at this point about any sort of holdout or anything for Dak Prescott. But you raise a great point, Susie. And we talked about this quite a bit going all the way back to March. Other teams would have been proactive and tried to get these done early. I mean, even the Vikings made a strong run at Justin Jefferson last summer after year three because they're figuring the market's going to go up. This is our best opportunity. Let's make a big push. They made Justin Jefferson a market-setting offer 
last summer. He didn't take it. And in the end, even though he got hurt last season, missed all that time with the hamstring, didn't put up the numbers that C.D. Lamb did, he still ended up getting paid in a monster way because the Vikings are paying for not just one of the best receivers in the NFL, maybe the best, but the gritty, the face of the franchise. In fact, you're moving away from Kirk Cousins. You want J.J. McCarthy to come up playing with Justin Jefferson. C.D. Lamb didn't get any sort of substantive negotiations prior to this offseason. Neither did Dak, neither did Mike McCarthy, neither is Micah Parsons. The Cowboys organizational philosophy for several years now, even though they have been a draft and develop team as opposed to a free agent or trade leaning team in recent years has been kicked the can down the road. Don't make decisions. Don't do the big deals until you have to do them. Now, is that partly because of the scars of like the Jalen Smith deal where they did that one early? They kind of had to because he was a second round pick. He only had a four year rookie deal, but they did that one early. It was a long extension. And then that knee injury that he suffered with Notre Dame in the Fiesta Bowl caught up with him and he just wasn't the same player again. So is that in the back of people's minds, maybe. They did Trayvon Diggs last year early. He suffers a torn ACL. Those things shouldn't ultimately matter because you pay the best players, and if you won't, somebody else will. Modern medicine is too good. You don't worry about knee injuries and things like you like you used to. But, you know, CD has also been a, a healthy player, and he's coming off of his best season. You know, the playoff game obviously wasn't good for anybody, and CD, like a lot of guys in the Cowboys, were out of sorts, but he's going to get his money. It's a matter of when and from whom. You're absolutely right. A lot of teams would have made a made an offer, tried to get this done earlier, but that just is not how the Cowboys have tried to do business. All right, from holding out to holding in, Brandon Ayuk, what are you hearing about him? Brandon Ayuk is there. He is in San Francisco. Uh, we don't at this point know how much. I don't believe they've been on the practice field yet exactly how much of anything he's going to do on the field. John Lynch said they expect, you know, all their players to be out there practicing. We'll see if that's the case for Ayuk. I think that, you know, this is a classic case where it's been a player driven storyline throughout the course of this offseason. You had some of the rumblings got out back before the draft. The 49ers did get calls, but they were asking for a really high price, a high first round pick or a, fir a first round pick and something else. Nobody was willing to offer that at that point. Once the draft passed, it really wasn't any reason for the 49ers to consider trading the guy because 2025 draft picks don't help you try to win a Super Bowl in 2024. So then every other development we've had has been. Ayuk recording a video with Jaden Daniels saying, hey, they don't want me here anymore. It's been Ayuk posting things on Instagram. It's been Ayuk requesting a trade. And the 49ers position really hasn't changed, which is you're a really important part of the team. We can't get anybody to replace you now. You're going to be on the team this season. They still want to work something out. There's a history of the 49ers getting deals done at the 11th hour right before the regular season begins. We'll see if it goes that direction. Uh, with Brandon Ayuk, but you also have to look in the macro here, Susie, which is the 49ers have had a very expensive team in recent years because they've paid veterans, not just their own guys, but in free agency. You have the Brock Purdy's of the world coming up here as well. This is all part of the moving the pieces around on the chessboard here. It doesn't mean they can't get something done with Brandon Ayuk, but with where the receiver market is going, uh, they've got their hands full trying to work that out before the season. Tom Pelissero joining us here on the Rich Eisen Show. I'm Susie Schuster in for Rich. Let's move over to Miami. We just heard a soundbite from Mike McDaniel calling the situation with Tua in Miami fluid, and he looked like he wanted to be anywhere but there. How do you, um, how do you translate fluid down there? I think Mike always kind of has that look on his face. There's a little little distance there. Uh, love Mike. He's a, he's a very unique character. He's, he's pretty transparent on a lot of this type of stuff. And what he said that this is fluid uh, is very much the way that I've understood it, which is that, you know, from day to day, is Tua going to do seven on seven only? Is he going to do 11 on 11? Is he going to do nothing? They don't really know. You know, during the spring, he missed a little bit of time. He was out there sometimes for seven on seven. They've been trying to get a contract done. And this is not, you know, a situation where it's, well, are the Dolphins going to pay Tua? Why aren't they paying him? That always seems to be the reaction, whether you're hearing from his teammates, from fans. They're trying. They're just not in agreement on what that number has to be. It's absolutely going to begin with a five. It's going to be $50 million dollars plus per year, but at a time where Trevor Lawrence just matched Joe Burrow at 55, are they going to go above that? Is it going to get done below that? Um, you also have a situation where the same agency represents all these quarterbacks that we've been talking about. They represent Athletes First represents Tua. They represent Jordan Love. They represent Dak Prescott. Different agents on each of those deals, but you know teams can't collude. Agents absolutely can communicate 
on some of these things. Uh, and, and so all these situations are at least to some degree tied together. I would think that, you know, in all likelihood, the next one to get done would be Jordan Love, just because it seems like things are a little bit um, on a better page right now. Um, but that's not to say that something won't get done in Miami with Tua either. You know, at some point he's got to weigh out the best offer that the Dolphins are going to make him versus the possibility of a guy with his medical history, his concussion history, playing out the last year of his rookie deal, and then in all likelihood getting franchise tagged in March anyway. I mean, these are, again, this is the business time of year, even though we're coming back into training camp. I honestly, Susie, can't remember. Somebody asked me this the other day. I don't really remember quarterbacks pulling the hold in, uh, you know, ever. The hold in is more of a recent thing over the last decade anyway, but we generally see it at other positions. Everything's different when you're talking about taking your quarterback off the field. So to the extent that you're watching guys who are not as good of a player as Tua, not as good of a player as Jordan Love, that that helps the players leverage. And as long as teams are not going to find the player for missing time or willing to forgive any fines if and when they get a long-term contract done, these guys can afford to wait up until the point where maybe the player feels like he's missing out on the reps. You brought him up. What are you hearing about Jordan Love? I would say that there's ongoing conversations. There's ongoing negotiations between the Packers and Jordan Love. I don't get the sense that we're that far off from being able to get to a deal. But as of last night, I didn't get the sense that anything was imminent on that front either. I mean, I would be very surprised if Jordan Love isn't the highest paid quarterback in NFL history by the time that he sets foot back on the practice field. Everybody's been very upfront. Brian Gutekunst, who is very good at not being transparent on a lot of things, said at the podium the other day, I mean, he's our franchise quarterback. He thinks that they're close at this point to getting a deal done. But as everybody knows who cover these negotiations, you know, it's like a Yoda line. There is no close. There is only done. And we're not yet done mm -hmm. in Green Bay. I do anticipate that's something that gets done in the not too distant future. What's the best Star Wars, Tom? You know, I've got Brockman, as you as you know, some holes in my uh, movie watching. I've I mean, definitely you did seen, just quote Yoda, so I, I assume that you've I've seen him. I've seen the original three Star Wars, okay. but not in a long time. I don't think I've seen any of the other. How many more are there? Six between prequels 13, and sequels? I think. Yeah, well, okay, six actual see, Star Wars movies and then all the spinoffs and whatnot. You only need to first I, I three ran out about episode episode one i think i was like i'm good i'm, <laughs> I'm good on, i'm good on the rest of the series here i'll say the empire strikes back how about that well i like the one with baby yoda what was that one but that's, that's mandalorian. mandalorian i like that but it's not baby yoda <laughs> it's not actually yeah it's all it's the same the child me. no yeah. i like the mandalorian i got it the rest of them, like Tom, honestly, until <laughs> until you have to sit there with your kids, that's Rich's bailiwick. Like he'll watch all of those. I tend to um, I tend to leave the room during all the other remakes. But the but <laughs> Return of the Jedi, he likes Empire Strikes Back. Empire Strikes. Was I going to ask you about Aaron Rodgers? But I mean, like I'm sorry, I'm getting now very distracted. You saw that he came into practice yesterday wearing a um, an Egypt inspired T-shirt because he really likes to be cryptic. It's like it kind of reminds me of the Phil Jackson soul patch, but that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> what are you hearing about Aaron Rodgers? Back in the day, it was a nice little. I just like the only thing I can consistently grow is this uh, right here. And he loved he loved to read the Power of Now. It was it was very moody with the Lakers back then, but that's a whole different conversation, one that should be discussed over drinks. What are you hearing about Aaron Rodgers? And then we'll talk about Hassan Reddick after that. Aaron kind of is the new Zen master. I, I like that. Uh, I like that comparison. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that Rogers, you know, at this point, Aaron kind of it feels like his entire life is trolling everybody who's not in his inner circle, which is a very small inner circle. So not ever speaking on exactly where he was, but then wearing an Egyptian shirt to the team facility, I'd say is basically par for the course. I haven't seen it doesn't look like he's talked to the media at large yet. He was out on the practice field, saw the red zone was a you know, a little bumpy two of seven passing in that today. It's the early stages of camp. Jets have a really good defense. Usually the defense is ahead of the offense. But, you know, to go back to minicamp and not being there, it's exactly days like this that people are going to take those little pot shots in print or on TV or whatever and talk about, well, making up for lost time. This is, you know, is it ultimately going to impact him in the season? I really don't think so. But it does impact just the way that everything is framed as we head into training camp here. This should be a really good um, you know, Jets defense, the offense has a lot of weapons. They need time to coalesce. But, you know, I, I happen to believe Garrett Wilson. I, I was at the game in Cleveland where he had a breakout type of performance going back where he played at Ohio State. 
and was unbelievable in that game. This is a couple of seasons ago. You watch a performance like that, regardless of who the quarterback was, and I think it was Flacco took over uh, in that game against the Browns. But you, you look at a guy like that, if Aaron Rodgers is out there, Garrett Wilson's going to take off the season. Aaron Rodgers being out there is going to open things up for Brees Hall. And Brees Hall in the running game for the Jets should take some things off of Aaron Rodgers' shoulders. The key in everything is going to be health. They invested in the offensive line. Rodgers, after what happened last year, playing four snaps and getting hit on two of them, is going to have to adjust his play style to a certain degree. He can't be the guy who's holding the ball and holding the ball and dancing around in the pocket and taking those hits because guess what? He's 39, going on 40 years old. You just can't do that at that age, especially a guy who's had, you know, not just the Achilles last year, but he's had a variety of calf injuries. He's had multiple broken collarbones through the course of his career. You can't take those chances. Uh, they got a better backup quarterback than they did last time around. They brought in Tyrod Taylor. Tyrod is, and I don't know his record off the top of my head, but he's basically a 500 type quarterback in his career. He got the bills to the playoffs back in 2017. So at least you have a fallback option, but if Aaron Rodgers goes down, the whole thing's over, Susie. Like, let, let's just be honest about it. If he goes down in week three, you're not running the table with Tyrod Taylor. Tyrod's there if Rodgers suffers a two-week injury or a four-week injury to keep this thing on the track. There's a lot of pressure on the Jets, but there's not as much pressure as a year ago because everything they've done up until the minicamp absence wasn't this public spectacle like it was last year with the trade and with uh, hard knocks and him coming in and whipping the crowd into a frenzy here. They're, as much as a team with Aaron Rodgers in New York can be under the radar, they're like a little bit under the radar. But the moment they set foot on the field Monday night in week one against the 49ers, none of that stuff matters. And if they start 0-1 before a national audience, it's going to be exactly the pressure cooker that the Jets are always in. All right. First of all, low-key, low-grade. I've never known a player to think he's trolling others when he's getting trolled at the same time. Like, I can't get over that. That's number one. Number two, do you think I'm crazy? Don't answer that. But don't you think that everyone's going to watch every single Aaron Rodgers game waiting to see whether he gets hurt? I feel like that might be the undercurrent of the season in a really weird way. Well, I think that that's, that's definitely part of it. I think people are going to be watching Aaron Rodgers for a lot of different reasons. Aaron Rodgers is on that short list of players in the NFL right now who I feel like everyone has an opinion about him. And in a lot of cases, you know, fair or not, it's a negative opinion just because of, you know, things that he's said in the past because he's kind of got, again, from the outside looking in, a lot of people think, you know, he's got a lot of diva to him at this point and he's kind of on his own program and he's selfish and all that. Like, I, I've known Aaron to the extent that anybody can know him. Going back to 2007 when I started out the Green Bay Press Gazette, I've always found him to be a really intelligent, thoughtful guy who can explain things in football and life in unique ways. And when you really kind of peel back the layers and he's comfortable with you, you know, you learn a lot uh, talking to Aaron Rodgers. So, you know, I, I think a lot of Aaron as, as a player, obviously a four-time MVP winner, he's a future Hall of Famer, uh, and as a person. But, you know, people are going to have opinions about him. There, there's absolutely no doubt about it. And again, Aaron has been, he's been very tough throughout the course of his career, but that play style, that extending the plays inside and outside the pocket and taking hits and throwing off his back foot, he's going to have to to rein some of that in. I you know it's it's human nature in the big moments in the fourth quarter, sure, try to make those throws, but first series against San Francisco when you got Nick Bosa and Javon Hargrave and Fred Warner all coming after you, I mean, if I'm the new, remember they got a new staff out there in, in San Francisco on defense, if I'm Nick Sorensen and Brandon Staley, Kyle Shanahan, like I'm dealing up blitz after blitz right out of the gate just to see, can this guy move? What's he going to do when we bring the pressure to him? That's historically been a dangerous thing to do with Aaron Rodgers because when he needs to get rid of the ball quickly, he's got this remarkable ability to see the field. He's got that really quick uh, release that he honed over years working with Mike McCarthy in the Packers quarterback school here. But I'm heating them up. And to, exactly to your point, Susie, forget the fans for a second here. If I'm other teams, I want to see how is this guy going to play is he going to be able to play? Not trying to hurt him, but let's force him into some spots where he's got business decisions that he has to make and see if he's still making the same decisions we saw in four snaps last season. I have time for one last question, so I'll ask you two. Hassan Reddick, will this get solved fast, yes or no? I don't think fast because I don't believe, based on the Jets' uh, recent history, I don't think that they're going to negotiate with a guy who's not there. It's a really weird situation. I don't remember 
a whole lot of situations like this because usually when you trade for a player, the guy comes in and takes a physical, and that's basically the player accepting the trade. You know, there were conversations about a new contract prior to the trade with Philadelphia that did not end up getting done. Now Reddick's saying, well, I still want a new deal. The Jets are saying, well, you're not going to get a new deal if you're not here. Reddick saying, well, I'm not showing up without the new deal. And so you got some odd uh, back and forth again. There's going to be, this is one of those things where, Susie, now that we've got football and all 32 teams will be practicing by tomorrow and we got a million other storylines, we probably won't talk a ton about Hassan Reddick, but it's definitely a different uh, type of a scenario here that the most logical thing to do would be you tack on some incentives or something, some type of upside onto the end of the contract just to get him back in. You know, the closest comp, it's not, you know, exactly right, but like the closest comp I can think of was last year. The Vikings had adjusted Daniil Hunter's contract in 2022, moved money up. So he had a really no, low number on the books in 2023. And in order to get him into camp, and resolve the situation they gave him a raise in 23 and a no franchise tag clause again i'm not saying that's what they're going to do with reddick he's on the books for like triple what hunter was uh but maybe there's some type of a, a scenario there where they can make some concessions that don't involve a long-term extension or a ton more money this season at least make him happy for this year and then hey play your way into a new deal in 2025 tom you're the greatest thanks again for your time i want to say happy birthday to the boys it was yesterday oh happy birthday Hey, yeah. Tommy. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. You know, how, how was your wedding, Brockman? Good? Relaxing? Did you make it back in time? Uh, I miraculously made it back Sunday night, but it was a 14-hour well, day. Good for you. <laughs> good for you. Good, good for, good for you. you. I don't think there was anything like the sight of me and Tom Pelissero rolling through the streets of Englewood with the top down all last week. It was like, if you saw us, I think you knew it was something special. Oh, yeah, and, that was brash. Wind blowing through my hair. <laughs> and it didn't move. Man. Don't make me I jealous. Stay. You should, I should have stayed. You should have stayed. stayed. That would have been a good. That would have been a good. A good business decision for me. Right. You could right. have just hung out here in the hotel down the street and <laughs> skipped all that airport madness. See, you'll think better next time. But Susie said, "Who was madder?" I think it was your wife. She was probably the most most mad. Right. She was at a girls' weekend, and my dad had the kids while we were oh, having open great. houses on our house. So yeah. Uh, that's what I missed out on over the weekend. Uh, dad was dad was supposed to be here, m meaning me. Uh, didn't work out that way. And now I'm taking off on Friday for a two-week, 12-day, uh, 12 12-team 12 camp trip, assuming that the airplanes can get off the ground. So that's I'm cool. winning big, Susie. And she's getting ready to here. murder you. Go buy her a <laughs> really, <laughs> really later. big thing of flowers. Thanks again for Have your fun, time. Tom. Appreciate it. Later, buddy. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.